worship team, we're going to have the wonderful Sarah come and play the harp all the way from Italy. It's funny, I'm going to talk about Malachi today, or if you like, the Italian prophet Malachi. So it's appropriate that we have uh, an Italian harp here um, that Sarah's going to play wonderfully for us. And that's just going to be a background. That suits me, I think, more than anything else why we minister. We're going to go live. And so we welcome everybody on the live stream and that might be watching this uh, after today. Um, just to remind everybody that we do have two groups during the week as well as this meeting. Uh, we have Tuesday night at AJ and Andrea's where we do a bit of mentoring, teaching, collaborating and getting around a good meal. And then we've started Thursday nights at my place uh, where Thursday night, uh, hopefully we enjoyed a reasonably good meal. Uh, and, and compliments to the chef. Is that right, Robbo? Absolutely. Absolutely. Robbo is a barrican for football, let me just say that. <laughs> he went to the showdown last night. This has to go live. We are all decked out in our supporters' outfit. We were plainly barracking for power. But Robbo came in neutral colours because he wasn't sure which way the game was going to go. And he was going to win either which way. Can I tell you, Christianity is not like a fence-sitting operation where you're always winning. You've got to barrack for a side, Robbo, and that we're on side Jesus. Just <laughs> we're on side Jesus. I joked about this last night on the bus. He didn't think I was going to say it, but I have because I'm at random like that. It won't be edited out. Peter Robertson, Adelaide. <laughs> That will shame him if just get him to give a poor power count comfortably. All right. So um, we have the two meetings and uh, everyone's really nervous now. Hang around with me. I will call you out. Um, Thursdays, in, and it's an activation time where we, we, we engage in some free worship, uh, prayer, and, and the whole idea about that is to get you activated into the teaching that you're hearing. In other words, the teaching that we're hearing has to become something of a reality in our life. It's not about uh, getting a more intellectual understanding of scripture. In fact, I'll talk against that today. What, what we're entering into is a realm of courageous faith. And courageous faith has a strategy not only to lay hold of something, but then to bring that, what we've laid hold of, into action. And so everything we're receiving is a place of receiving it in the heart. We contemplate it. We allow it to renew our mind. And then by the work of the Holy Spirit becomes a realm of faith that we then start to move into things we didn't think were possible. And I want to give that some context today in the protocols of war. I'm going to round out this series by talking about courageous faith in stories of courage. The Bible is replete with stories of courage, of amazing stories of men and women who didn't know, have it all worked out. And if, if you look carefully at the storyline of Scripture, God has this unusual tendency to use the vulnerable, instill courage in them, and then win a battle that looks nothing like our common sense would call us to win. So God's not logical in the way he goes to battle. And I hope I've demonstrated that in the last couple of weeks. He chooses unlikely people to do unlikely things. I mean, you only have to look at Joshua and, and they, they cracked some glass jars and they shouted and literal walls came coming down. Can I tell you, if you stand in your back garden, crack a glass and shout at the wall, it won't come down. So you've got to be careful how you use what God is saying in a context. But the key difference was that it was a command of God in the presence of God and plainly God did that through the obedience of those who are listening to him. And there's the faith obedience that doesn't move God. God's already moved you towards faith obedience before he moves. He's gone ahead of you, remember? He's the God that goes before you. And when he goes before you, he has your future in mind and he brings it into the present. And he gives you a present word of instruction to engage in something that looks impossible in yourself. When God is giving you a word and you can accomplish it in yourself, the trap we fall into in the church is we feel we have to accomplish it in our own ability. And so we try to strengthen our own ability 
and right the faith realm out of what God's doing. God chooses the foolish things to confound the wise. Now, you've got to look at the story of Scripture where he does this over and over and over again. And I spoke to you about Gideon before, where Gideon's army was reduced. Well, if it doesn't make sense to win a battle by reducing your army, you normally increase it. Correct? So God's strategies are not like our human logical thinking of how to have a battle. In every battle, he's the difference for us. He's the difference. He is the one bringing the victory. And so we have to be careful how we build our theology through Scripture and make sure that it doesn't stop at the apostles, then all of a sudden, we God not doing what he once did. So if we're under a new covenant, and it's a superior covenant, is God the same yesterday, today, and forever? Is the new covenant something that's more profound, more powerful, than even the old covenant, which had a particular administration? Yes. So the first miracle that Jesus is called into by courageous faith, on a timeline of the demand, is to actually pour out wine at the wedding feast of Cana. So his first miracle, according to John, is a shift in administration and points to a new wine or the working of the Holy Spirit being predominant in the New Testament reality for every believer. Remember in the Old Testament that God was with them, but he was never in them. He was on them for an anointing for a task so that what was on them was in them. And when that anointing came upon, and I'm going to take you some stories, you'll see this. When, when God was on them by way of anointing, what also transposed was God's faith. It's really important to understand this because when we, when we start to see what faith does, it, motor, it does a whole range of things. The difficulty with what I said to you week one when I started the series was there was a theology that developed where basically after the apostles, God stopped doing things amazing. He stopped moving in power. That apostolic age was finished. We're now into the church age and we've now got the word of God. But the problem was the very covenant nature of the New Testament was limited by the theology that was taught. Your theology will shape your beliefs. If you don't believe God's doing it anymore, then you won't believe God's doing it anymore. God's still doing it. God has not changed his idea about how he wants to move in and through you. And in particular, it's part of his eschatological, that means any time, apocalyptic, revelatory narrative. In fact, it's fundamental to what Jesus was doing at the cross. He was destroying all the works of the enemy. And in doing that, what he did was he made himself Lord of the cosmos. Now that language is new to us in the church, but not to every scholar that's ever studied. The scholars understand that Jesus at the cross was became, became the king over all the cosmos, seen and unseen. And that's why... Ephesians, Paul talks about this very, very clearly to excite our faith to a reality that we're seated with Christ in heavenly places. If you've got an intellectualism in your theology, you will not be able to grasp what you can only get by revelation of the Holy Spirit. In other words, what God shows you is beyond your worldly understanding. In fact, Paul says to the Corinthians, the cross in all of its depth, its measure and power is foolishness to man. When you look at the church, you'll look at an imperfect people. Who'd agree with that? You would look at a broken people and perhaps a frail and vulnerable people that cannot in of themselves possibly achieve the vision God has for them. Would that be fair? And if you're not thinking like that, let me tell you, your limitation is too low. And what's happened is you've reduced God down to who you are rather than bringing yourself up to who God says he can be in you and through you. 
In other words, there's got to be a measure where you are out of your depth in your natural ability, natural understanding to the assignment that God's called you to, to access the realm of faith where God moves. God moves where you finish. What we do is we reduce God back into our situation and say, Lord, you need to move according to my logic, according to my ways, and to how I'm feeling right now. Where's your faith in all of that? It starts to dry up, doesn't it? And what happens is, it's the strategy of hell for you to become overwhelmed by the circumstances around you while you keep through fear to work through a logical answer to something that can only be done by God and a logic that comes from Him, not from you. Making sense? So we will see some, some wonderful examples uh, in the story uh, today about numerous men and women of faith. And I find it intriguing that there were people who were not entitled covenantally to things that they were able to have access to. Now we're in a different position in the New Testament. So everything I'm going to say today in the Gospel examples is still under the Old Covenant. It becomes particularly important when I talk about the woman from Canaan. The Canaanites were not entitled to the children's bread. But what I want you to notice in every story is how the person went past the apparent opposition of God's testing. Now in the New Covenant, Paul clearly teaches us through Corinthians that everything, all the promises are yes, to which we bring the amen. So that means it's already established in the heart of God, we're not twisting his arm. They're already established in Christ Jesus. Now you're called to live by the Spirit in your union with who? In Christ Jesus. So when you're living in Him and moving by the Holy Spirit, leading you, you're going to have God's faith in the promises that He's already made up His mind to bring forward. Does that make sense? So when you're moving in the Holy Spirit, and you're moving in that union with Christ, and this is the key, this is the central key of this mystical union that Paul talks about. He says this is the great divine revelation of the new covenant. We're moving in this now relationship through the Holy Spirit with Christ Jesus. The life of Christ now is now shaping our life and now we're coming into his thinking, into his ways, and now we're going to access what's fully available in him. So every promise is yes, but where is it? It's in the eternal kingdom realm. Is it yet manifested on earth? No. How do you take that which it already is in the realm of the kingdom, the promise, and cause it to manifest? There's a word. It's called courageous faith. You access it by believing it. And the Holy Spirit will bring a present word and an unction to your heart in any moment to say, this is what I'm doing. If you have a theology of limitation, you will not have a faith expectation to the present word. In other words, what you'll do is, oh, God will do it my way in the way that I think I would do that. Can I just say, if we accept our frailty, if we accept our humanity is no match for God's divinity and His power and His strength, then your present understanding will lean into His word to give you understanding. Because every present word comes forward with his faith. You don't get faith by more haka shaka. You don't get more faith by simply intellectually reading the word. You get more faith by being with him and beholding him and knowing him and knowing the words that are revealed to your heart because they're spirit and they're life. They are greater than your present intellectual understanding. They will explode your intellect into a greater understanding of how God moves. Now, that is to build your faith. It's faith that accesses what God has already done. That's where we bring the amen from. The amen means establish it as it already is. So be it. Establish it as it already is. When Jesus taught his disciples to pray, and this hasn't finished as a pattern of prayer, not just for the apostles, but for the, all the church, our approach is worship. Our Father, 
our father. We're not orphans. We're not outsiders. We're image bearers. We're sons and daughters. It's our father. Jesus is our superior older brother who's the king of the cosmos. It's a family affair. Sometimes it's hard for us to get our head around these heavenly truths. But that's where the realm of faith has to be activated. You've got to get out of your flesh and into the revelation. Your flesh will keep you grounded. And God will look like you instead of you looking like God through the realm of revelation and faith. Am I making sense today? So we see that, that every example that we have, somebody had to push past what God seemed to be testing them in. There was at first a denial. Who's had a prayer and you felt that you got a denial or God didn't answer you? Or put your hand up. Because that's how we feel. But I'm going to teach you today that even those who were not entitled necessarily to the covenant promise were given access to it and God called it, well, Jesus called it, courageous faith. Courageous faith is overcoming faith. Now we're called to be more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. How many, how many times have you read that? Do you feel like it? Not always, right? We don't feel like conquerors because we also understand our humanity, our vulnerability, our frailty, and our imperfection, if we're honest. Yeah. The worst thing we can do is pretend about those things and say we've arrived. That's the level of pride which will thwart the realm of faith. So humility allows you to call upon him who longs to be called upon and has gone before you. In other words, the issue with fear becomes pride. The issue of love and humility becomes faith. It's the posture of the heart. So let's say that God calls me into an assignment, or you into an assignment, or to go and do something, and he, he, he says, I want, I want you to go and do this very thing. I want you to barrack for Port Adelaide. No, I'm just joking. I want you to do this very thing. And, and yes, I like spirit, right? And, and the first thing, the first thing you do subconsciously is, how am I going to do that? That seems against my normal thinking, or that seems impossible, or I don't have the resources. Anyone thought like that? And God is saying to you, I'm not asking you to do it in your present ability, I'm asking you to do it in my ability and my provision. Do you see the step? The step of faith, you've got to get past you and into him. And that step between what you know and what you're capable of in your frailty to what he can do in his absolute divinity is that step of faith that then calls, I've got to overcome something. Now, sometimes the overcoming is from within, but sometimes the overcoming is from without. And you've got to learn how to measure that and what is God. And I said to you last week, I'm the sort of guy that I'll knock on the front door and if I don't get an answer, I'll go around the back. I don't care if the dogs are barking. You know, who called the dogs out? I don't really mind. I'll go around the back until I get what I want. And I've learned that because of overcome, the power of overcoming faith. Now, if I've done all that I can, I keep asking, knocking and seeking, there may be a time period before it establishes. It's not denial. What God is doing is he's working out what is a desire that joins with his desire for me or a desire of my flesh that's for me. Wants to bring him glory, wants to bring me glory. Sometimes we want things because we'll look good. Sometimes we want things at the expense of deepening our relationship and our trust with God. Who's ever been through a valley situation in their life? Oh yes, I'm talking to the right group. And so you get led, Psalm 23 says, into the valley of the shadow of death. What happened to happy Christianity? You see, you get refreshing in the mountaintop. That's in his secret place. He gives you refreshing. He establishes you. You know his heart. You know his ways. You're starting to establish yourself in him more and more. Then all of a sudden he leads you out of that place into the valley of the shadow of death. The valley of the shadow of death is the world around you. It's a fallen world. 
A lot of Christians like the idea that we stay in our holy huddle and I'm a great Christian when it's me and God. I've got a problem with everyone else. That's where I get challenged, right? That, that's the truth of the matter. But God has never designed us just to be a relationship with Him and me and I'm on my, on my own. The whole idea is for me to give expression to that reality in adverse circumstances. And sometimes it's relational. Sometimes it's in the world around me. Sometimes God wants me to employ what He did in the finished work of the cross in a circumstance that is way beyond me. But you know it's God leading you. Why? Because there is that unction within you. You know as you know. And that's where you get the moment you say, right, where is the provision? Because in the valley of the shadow of death, there is an anointing and a provision you can't get when you're on the mountaintop. It's in the moment. You see, we don't like in the moment. We want it worked out. Please give me the protocols. Please give me the nine-point plan. And where are we on the nine-point plan? Am I talking to anybody today? God doesn't work like that. Your nine-point plan doesn't work with God. He's on the God plan. He's on the present now plan. And I've already got it worked out because I've already gone way into your future. I'm the God of history. I'm the God of the future. I know the beginning from the end. Trust me, I've got the best strategy that makes no sense to you and your logic. That's why this is foolishness. It sounds ridiculous. What do you mean? God's going to use me, us, to do extraordinary things? You're kidding me. So you're going to have to find a resolve. You're going to have to find a resolve. And that resolve has to be in Him. If your resolve is in you, then you'll be limited by you. You'll be limited by your obvious imperfection. And if you're not sure of that, get your wife to point it out to you. No men laughed. I noticed that. All the ladies laughed. No men laughed. You see, the reality is we can all see the imperfection in each other, correct? Now, is one of the realities that we're going to be conformed to the likeness of Christ? Yes. That's a process. But on the way, God's got good works for you to do. We're not waiting to be, we'll become mature before God uses us. He uses us in our immaturity. But he uses us according to the level of our faith in our immaturity. Everything's done according to the measure of our faith. It's making sense so far. So let's, let's have a look at this, this, this idea of Romans 8.28, that we are more than overcomers. Why are we overcomers? Because Jesus overcame the world. He's destroyed everything that stands in your way. And he's taken it upon himself. And now he's transferred you as a slave from the kingdom of darkness, which you didn't even know you were a slave to, into the freedom of his kingdom realm as a son and an heir, of which he's the superior older brother. And he's your king. And he speaks to you in a family business and says, Let's continue the project because when I destroyed all the darkness on the cross, you are to continue to keep that reality before the darkness and keep destroying the darkness until I come back. If we agree with evil, we empower the enemy against our future and we deny the power of the cross. The power of the cross is more powerful, more cosmic more amazing than we've ever, ever grasped. So before Jesus goes to the cross, there is a measure of faith I want to talk about to say how much more should we have given we're in a superior covenant? How much more are we equipped through the Holy Spirit within us and the anointing upon us to do the very things God's called us to do, even though we're still yet immature, imperfect, a little bit shaky around the edges and the assignments we're given look too big for us to accomplish in ourselves, And that's the point. That's how you know it's God talking to you. Because as conceited as you can get, God's even more big or bigger in the way he gives expression to what he wants you to do. 
And the first inclination of the flesh is to see the impossibility, and the first inclination of the spirit is to see the possibility because God's with you. Romans 8, 28. So we are convinced that every detail of our lives is continually woven together for good. For we are his lovers who have been called to fulfill his designated purposes. Now Psalm 139 says, when you're put on this earth, when you're knitted together in your mother's womb, you come with a prophetic destiny and purpose to co-labor and to bring forward the kingdom. Some take that up, some don't take that up. But your eternal rewards and your eternal reality is shaped on you coming into a belief system with Jesus Christ to be transferred out of darkness into the light that you may become heirs of everything that Jesus has established. It's all available to you. Then it goes on. Paul says, for he knew all about us before we were born and he destined us from the beginning to share the likeness of his son. Now when you share the likeness of Jesus Christ, you also share the heart of Jesus Christ and the mission of Jesus Christ. So where do we come like Jesus Christ, and for all of those that have done the Sonship series, that's what it's all about. So, just to help people who might be hearing this for the first time, when, when God said in Genesis that let's, let us create them in our image, humanity, it means that he was bequeathing to us a divine nature in the realm of his name being breathed into us, in our fragile earthly body, that would be those that would be priests and kings into the world. We will be sons of God. We will be the image bearers. We would be the supernatural spirit-born children of God in a fleshly body. In the same way that Jesus had to come in the flesh, but he was equally God and equally man. But he emptied himself of his divinity so he could show us what humanity could look like fully possessing, taking over the Holy Spirit. He was led by the Spirit, he carried the Spirit, and he was submitted to the Spirit in relationship to the Father. He becomes the model, the example of sonship. Paul says we've got that witness burning into our heart that you are the sons of God, therefore you're the image bearers of God. It's part of the process of you becoming more and more and more like Jesus in your internal nature. Why? Because Jesus, when you're born again, has put his nature in you. See, when you're born again, Scripture is very clear about this, that you carry the divinity of Christ within you, in your spirit man. But I live from the frailty of my flesh. This is the contradiction. And God knows that. So as Christ is being formed in you, more and more as you're giving yourself to that truth and that reality, and you're renewing your mind to that reality, and the Holy Spirit is leading you to develop you, God's giving you things to do on the way that are going to look impossible. The first place that you've got to see is that God is working everything together for your good. Does he allow opposition to come into your life? Yeah. Who's heard of resistance training? Yeah? If you want to grow big muscles, like Johnny, then you have to bench press pretty big weights. It's called resistance training. The greater the devils, the greater the levels. If you want to develop your character, it will be tested. Why? Because your faith is to be refined like gold. And gold is subjected to a fair bit of heat. When it's subjected to heat, a bit of resistance training, it's amazing what comes out. So who we really are is not who we say we are on Sunday, but when we're under the pressure of a situation. It's called toothpaste. You can say you're McLean's all day, but if it's Colgate in there and you squeeze, that's what's coming out. All right? You mean, when you squeeze, who, who, you know what I mean by being squeezed? Who, who's been put under pressure 
And then all of a sudden, this, this character that you you thought you dealt with is no longer dealt with. And it pops out. I've been around you. It comes out of the footy as well. But this, this character trait is who we are in pressure. So God allows us to be tested, to develop something, for us to recognize that maybe we haven't got it all together. And the amazing thing about God is when you haven't got it all together, He'll give you an assignment that looks bigger than your character can handle. Because it's not based on your character, it's based on the assignment and His anointing to do the job. Am I making sense? Yeah. So we see this when we come to the protocols of increase. When God stands in denial to us, or he's silent to us, so when God stands in silence to us, is he in denial to us? No. And sometimes God might say words to you that will put you off. I'll show you. This is uh, something I think is very helpful. Let's start with the, the wedding at Cana. The wedding at Cana. It's just the first miracle. It's in John to John chapter 2. And no less than Mary, Jesus' mother. And Mary's a wonderful example of the power of intercession. It's the way we can interpret this miracle. But it's, it's increasingly interesting for me how we want to read this text. Now, I don't know about you, when I first read this, I said, I thought to myself, gee, I don't think Jesus has been very kind to his mum. How I read it. Did everyone read the miracle? I don't think Jesus is particularly being kind to his mum. Let's read the text. Now we know that this is alcoholic wine. It's not non-alcoholic wine. They had alcoholic wine in those days. I don't know the history and how we try and manipulate history to, to read down text. But this is alcoholic wine. This is the best wine. It was part of Jewish custom that you, you would not run out of wine. It's a complete embarrassment in the festivities uh, of the marriage to, to run out of any hospitality at all, especially in Jewish culture, where hospitality was highly prized. So this is what the, the text says. After going out from there, Jesus went to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A camp, oh, sorry, wrong text. Canaan. Okay, that's the next one. John 2. Now, on the third day, Jesus' mother went to the wedding feast in the Galilean village of Cana, and Jesus and his disciples were all invited to the banquet. But with so many guests, they ran out of wine. And when Mary realized it, she came to Jesus and asked, They have no wine. Can't you do something about it? Now, can I suggest to you that she had treasured things in her heart for a long, long time? This is the woman where the Holy Spirit hovered over her. So she was used to that realm and that dimension. Treasuring these things in her heart, she feels the unction. There's a moment in time to activate Jesus. She's not making a complaint of, Jesus, can you go down the shop? Can you go down to BWS and see if you can pick up another dozen reds? That's not in play here. She's clearly thinking that Jesus and only Jesus can bring a solution to the situation at hand. Now look at, look at the response. Look at the response of Jesus. Jesus replied, My dear one, that's the Passion Translation being very nice, the, the NET says, woman. Listen here, woman. I don't know about you, but I, I just go, what? Meek and mild Jesus. Listen here, woman. Don't you understand that if I do this, it will change nothing for you, but it will change everything for me. My hour for unveiling my power has not yet come. So why would he distance himself from his relationship to his mother when he's pronouncing the time that comes from the father? What's he saying to her? I love you, but your word is not as powerful as my father's word. 
I love you. But your word is not as powerful as my Bible. He sets the timing of things, not your request. But look at her response. Mary then went to the servers and told them, whatever Jesus tells you, do it. She blew him off. She blew off a very proper, godly response and basically said, just get it done. I'm not taking no for an answer. Isn't that how you read that? That's what she's saying. So there is a permission in the realm of the Spirit to activate something the Holy Spirit is showing you against what might be a proper response. And God says, ah, that realm of faith activates my hand to move. The first miracle was reformation. Why? Because Jesus said, I can't pour the new wine of the Holy Spirit under the New Testament under the Old Testament model and administration. I can't pour out the Holy Spirit that I need to do under the old priestly order and under the old covenant order. We have to come into a new order to pour it out. I need a new wineskin. I need a new administration to facilitate the work of the Holy Spirit getting where it needs to go. What's the key of the New Testament that the apostles show us? The power of the Holy Spirit on you, in you, and working through you. It's God that takes center stage, not the individual. Okay? Let's have a look at another example of great faith. And this is Matthew 15, 21. And this is the Canaanite woman that I jumped the gun to. After going out from there, Jesus went to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from that area came and cried out, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. I don't have time to explain Son of David and those things today. But my daughter is horribly demon-possessed. But Jesus didn't answer her a word. Crickets. Mercy. Have mercy. God merciful. You're merciful, God. You'll hear my cry of mercy. Crickets. How many of us would have that that stage said, oh, it's not God's will? In fact, what she was asking for was the power of the kingdom to be demonstrated, but outside of the covenant that was given to Israel. She's a Canaanite. Was she entitled as of right to the benefit of that covenant? No. But she was entitled to it by great faith. And where else does God do this in the history of Scripture? David built his tabernacle under the old covenant of Moses. It was illegal. Yet God gave him a future grace in the present to say, build something that I will point to later on. It was a shadow and type of that which would be fulfilled and talked about by the apostles in the book of Acts. Amos said that he was going to restore his fallen tabernacle of David. But David was able to build it under an administration of the old covenant that didn't facilitate it. What? Can you access by faith things that historically you've been limited in laying hold of? Absolutely. Let's have a look. Keep going here. My daughter is horribly demon possessed, but he did not answer her a word. Then the disciples came and begged him, send her away, because she keeps on crying out after us. So he answered to the woman, I was only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. What's he saying? You're not within the scope of my mission. You're not within the scope of my assignment. But here you are pressing in. How many of us then at that stage would have said, I'm out? Most of us. But she keeps going. This is why these are great examples. Look at what she said. But 
But she came and bowed down before him. Most of us would have turned and gone. But she had a resolve. You've got what I need and I can't get it anywhere else. You've got what I need. I can't get it anywhere else. This is just not a story that I've seen in the text. I've seen this when we've ministered around the world. I, 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 I've been in meetings in third world nations where they carry their sick for hours to come and get healed because they don't have an alternative. They don't have the ability in some of these regions to go to doctors and if they did, they don't have the money. They don't have the alternative. See, sometimes great desperation leads us to great faith. And one of the barriers that David Hogan, I remember a time speaking with him at a dinner, the Lord rebuked him and said, if you want to see the greater level of miraculous, you're going to have to stop being comfortable. David Hogan, like if anyone... <laughs> At the faith of David Hogan, you'd be like, oh, oh, oh. And the Lord rebuked him and said, if you want to see the greater level, you've got to stop becoming comfortable with what I've already done. There's a settling down that takes place in our spirit sometimes. And we talk about what God did, but we forget about what God's doing. It's great to hear the stories because they build our faith. But they build our faith so we can see, hear, and understand for what God is doing, not what he once did. Lord, help me. It's not right, Jesus said, to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Oh my goodness me. Jesus would be hung up and courted by the media today. That is not appropriate language, right? <laughs> Now, what does dogs mean? It means unbeliever. You're, of, you're not of Israel. You're an unbelieving person. He didn't, he didn't mean it that she's an unbeliever because she's clearly a believer, but you're, of the, you're a Gentile. You understand what I'm saying? Hang on, what are you doing here? And he puts her off again. How many of us would have been out of that conversation, that prayer, oh, no, God doesn't want me to have it for my daughter? Most of us. Yes, Lord, I love this. Yes, Lord, she replied. But even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. You're not going to get rid of me. If you offer me a crumb, that'll be enough. I'm not going to go away till I get what you said I can have. I, even if you say I can't have it, even if it's not bread, and I'm a dog, I know you can give this to me. There's nowhere else I can get this. I know as I know as I know. And I will not turn away. And look what Jesus said. And Jesus answered her, Woman, your faith is great. Let what you want be done for you. And the woman's daughter was healed from that hour. What are we pressing in for? And what are we dissuaded by? See, comfort will say, oh, that's too hard. What are you really going after in the things of God? According to what He has promised. Because we never have to have the crumbs from the table. And somehow on the journey, we've settled for crumbs. When we've got the whole loaf. I mean, why are we eating crumbs when the whole loaf's available? Look at the persistent widow, widow in Luke 18. And now here she wanted justice. In a certain town there was a judge, a thick-skinned and godless man who had no fear of others' opinions. And in the same town there was a poor widow that kept pleading with the judge. Grant me justice and protect me from my oppressor. He ignored her pleas for quite some time, but he kept asking but she kept asking, kept asking. You know that drip, 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 drip. I'm going to 
going to keep asking you. I'm going to keep asking. I want justice. I'm going to keep asking. I'm going to keep asking. And I'm going to keep asking. And what I'm going to do is smash the theology that you only have to ask once and it's done. That's not true. And it violates the protocols of increase that Jesus talked about when he spoke about the ability to keep asking, keep knocking, keep seeking. When you keep doing it, it's the persistence that demonstrates your faith. It's the persistence that demonstrates your faith to lay hold of what might, first of all, not be answered. Or you might get a, hey, have some crumbs. No, I'm not having the crumbs. I want the loaf. In this case, I want justice from my oppressor. So she keeps going. He ignored her pleas for quite some time, but she kept asking. Eventually, he said to himself, this widow keeps annoying me, demanding her rights, and I'm tired of listening to her. Even though I'm not a religious man, and I don't care about the opinions of others, I'll get her off my back by answering her claims for justice, and I'll rule in her favour. What happens in heaven happens in the world. You, you only have to be a persistent a minority to shape the influence of decision makers. But you have to be persistent to the point where you're not going away. When you lose your commitment to the truth that's at hand, you will no longer be persistent. You'll be comfortable. And when you choose comfort over persistent for what is right, you'll get swallowed up in the popular voice. But minority groups make an influence in the world because they are persistent, they're strategic, and they keep going until they get what they want. And they make the minority sound like the majority. It's a spiritual principle outworked by minorities. But you've got God on your side. He is a righteous judge. He's not an angry judge. He's, not a, he's, a, he's going to give you what you want. If an angry judge through persistence can get you what you want, worldly concept, how much more a righteous judge who's your father sitting in heaven, the courts rigged in your favour? Stuart would know he'd probably have to recuse himself. He's got a bias. God's biased towards you. Can I just say something? There's, there's a passage in Isaiah that basically says if you don't come before God to plead your case, God has to give a case answer, a judgment against you because somebody else, the demonic, is pleading their case. Hello? God is a righteous judge. He's got protocols. There is a justice system. And the justice system works on advocacy. And that is why Jesus is your high priest in the heavenly court, constantly interceding for you with the Holy Spirit and the cloud of witnesses. Your court is loaded in your favour. All you have to do is go there and plead your case. All the evidence is stacked in your favour. But if you don't go there, you're a non-represented litigant. You're a no-show. So why wouldn't you plead your case? Let me say something here. If you're frustrated with the things going on around you, then you should suffer from a holy discontent if you've got any measure of the Holy Spirit and righteousness in you. You should be suffering from a holy discontent. Things are not right. I don't know if you, I don't know if you feel that way. I feel that way. But I go, okay, this holy discontent, I can criticise everyone or I can go to my Father and seek justice. Where's my poor call? Where do I have an audience by the blood of Jesus that the court that's already working in my favour and I'm simply joining in as a litigant to a cause God wants me to present to him? What's our prayer life like? Can, can, can I say, the guy at work that's been annoying you, you, you don't engage in witchcraft to remove him. Sorry, Brett. I just, you know... What you do, I'm not saying you do, but it's just that look. You know, oh, is that the wrong prayer? You pray righteously. 
Okay, there's a difference between a prayer of a guy, right? That means change him or remove him. The prayer of righteousness is, Lord, he's in bondage. He's broken, even as I'm broken. But Lord, bring the revelation that Jesus Christ set him free, that he may be all he's meant to be. Because I see that behavior is inconsistent with how you see him. Lord, that behavior is an expression of a heart that is broken, and you see the heart. And so deliver him and heal him and set him free. And when you pray the blessing like that over your enemy, you've shown yourself to be like a son, Jesus says. And what happens is the guy gets free, and all of a sudden the, the, the calamity that was in the atmosphere because of his disorder becomes peace. What I'm trying to explain to you is warfare is first in the realm of the spirit before it manifests in the natural. And in the natural, we need to contend for something that's available to us in the spirit. And we have to push past some things. And we have to even push past the obstacles that God tests us with to see if we're sincere about it. Why, why does God want us to be sincere about our pursuit? Because he knows we'll value it and steward it correctly. Because the next part of courageous faith is not just receiving something, it's manifesting something. So we, we can have faith to receive, but do we have faith to reveal? You need faith for both. It's faith to receive, and then faith to reveal. So you're going to get opposition sometimes to receive, it's a testing of God. Or the enemy will come in and say, ah, 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 ah. you're not allowed that. You're a Canaanite. You're not allowed that, it's not part of it. You can only have the crumbs. You go, okay, I'll have the crumbs. If you don't know the promises of God, you don't know what you're asking for. They're all yes. Like bank SA, can I have a loan? Yes. Can I have another hundred thousand? Yes. It's all yes. Then why doesn't God answer it straight away? Because he's seeing what's in your heart, not his. Do you really want it? And why do you want it? What's your motivation? What does James say? You have not because you ask not, and when you do ask, you pray with the wrong heart motivation. Does he want you to bring forward the kingdom in every area of your life? Yeah. It's given. That's why Jesus said the first prayer you pray is on earth as it is in heaven. On earth. Let it be on earth as it is in heaven. In the area of my finances, let it be on earth as it is in heaven. In the area of my job, let it be on earth as it is in heaven. In the area of my marriage, my relationships, whatever I'm doing, let it be on earth as it is in heaven. Why? Because when that happens, he's gone before you. When you ask for on earth as it is in heaven, the cross comes into full view of every principality and power. Now they know who you are. See, you're more than an overcomer in him. And so we, we need to be able to then give expression as faith 11, uh, sorry, as Hebrews 11 talks about. Now everyone's read the book of, of, of Hebrews yet. You go to 11. Now faith is. Now faith is. Now faith is. So now faith is a present faith. It's not tomorrow's hope. It's not yesterday's knowledge. Yesterday, knowledge is yesterday, faith is now, hope is what's coming. And we activate in the realm of faith in the now, being fully present in the now. Now, faith is the certainty and the security of that which we cannot see. Where do we know that it's already established? In Christ. It's not like we're sucking our thumb, we're pulling it out of what Jesus has already established. And when we pray in his name, it's the Father's glory to give us the very thing we ask for. Why? Because he paid a price for it. He paid the price for it. Right? He bought the, he, he bought the pizza. You've got the ticket that says the pizza's coming. You change that for when the pizza comes. Hey, I've got a pizza. It's coming. Oh, that's right. It's this one. Boom. He's paid for it. 
Everything's established in Him. Everything. Everything you need, every resource, every every part of your humanity, what you need in all your weakness, what you need in all your frailness, what you need to fulfill the assignment that's impossible at hand is in Him. It's all available. So faith does things to us. I'm going to close on this. Faith does things to us. It manifests through us. You know, when you look at Hebrews 11, what I find phenomenal in reading that is there's nothing mentioned about the failures of everyone that is there as a trophy of faith. There's no mention of their failures. Why is that? Because Hebrews 11 is a memorial to God. He doesn't look at your failures. He only looks at your faith successes. You're his trophy of his ability. I'll say that again. Because this, you've got to get your head around this. You're his trophy of his ability. Not your own. It doesn't mean you don't have skills. It doesn't mean you don't pursue things in life. I'm not saying that. It doesn't mean you sleep on the couch and God does it all. I'm not saying that at all. What I am saying is, even on your best day, you're not up to the thing God's asking you to do. But he is. Whatever it is. And look at what faith does. Look what faith does in, in the present assignment. Faith moved able to choose a more acceptable sacrifice. Ever wondered about that? Why was one sacrifice accepted and the other wasn't? Because one came with faith. Right from the very beginning. Faith translated Enoch. Translated means he was here no more. In fact, Hebrews 11 says this, without faith, living within us. I like that translation. Living within us. Faith lives within us. Who's the faith or what is the faith living within us? Jesus. Jesus trusts himself. And he trusts the Father. So when the Holy Spirit is bringing the word of God that comes from the Father to you, it comes forward with his faith. Faith lives within you through the power of the Holy Spirit. For we come to God in faith, knowing that He is real, that He rewards the faith of those who passionately seek Him. Faith opened Noah's heart to receive revelation and warnings from God about what was coming, even though those things had never been seen. Hey, go build an ark with gopher wood for the flood that's coming. Uh, this is the desert. We've never seen rain. I'm not saying this thing. Because God's about to invite you into things you've never seen before or never done before. And your natural logic is not going to be able to be used. You're going to have to depend on what God's saying to you. And that is why you need to be found in the secret place, in a contemplative place with Him, studying the Scriptures, reflecting on the Scriptures, looking at these stories, of these great men and women of faith. They're all through the Bible. They're the champions of faith. I could go on and on and on and on. And they all set up a memorial. And their stories for us to build our faith. To say, if God used them, surely He can use me. Moses wasn't perfect. But God said, I'll be with you. Joshua wasn't perfect. But He said, I'll be with you like I was with you with Moses. What is the point of difference? Is God with you in courageous faith will be in your heart? And God will use you in ways you never thought possible. To do things you never thought you were capable of doing. That looked impossible, but in Him are possible. That's where we're at. If we don't find our voice again, 
about God and the world, then an alternative culture will be built if it's not already been built. We are the influencers against all odds but courageous faith to be the voice, the sound, the representation, albeit imperfectly, albeit with all of our fragility, into a world that is looking, longing for the alternative. Because where we're heading, there's only one direction. And yet God allows us to be diminished so that he can show himself strong. Amen? Who's falling asleep because of the heart that was very yellow and soothing? Yeah. I'm going to pray for you all. I'm going to pray for those people online as well. Who, who wants to be that person that is welling up with courageous faith? We all do. I was just amazed that the angel must have been playing the strings as the hand was up. Let's focus. Father, we thank you. If we're honest, we get challenged by some of the stories in Scripture. We recognize our own frailty. We recognize our burning heart for things that seem impossible. But Lord, we know with you all things are possible. So Lord, we ask for that gift of the Holy Spirit of your faith. We ask for that courage. We, we, we pray the prayer of Acts chapter 4 over ourselves today. You see all that's going on, Lord. You see it all. You see it all. You sit in the heavens and you laugh at the schemes of men. And whilst the world looks at the impotence of the church, you see its true power in you. And I pray, Father, right now for the release of an empowerment, an enabling, a manifestation of the Holy Spirit upon us and in us and around us that changes the way we view the world and the holy discontent that it causes to stir up in our hearts. That you would stir in our hearts again faith responses to what you're saying and what you're doing. To bring forward the very things you've called us to bring forward. No matter what they look like, Lord. And I pray that you would bring us together with a company of faith champions. Men and women who would build each other up in their holy faith in you. To build us up into courageous decisions that look impossible. Even foolish in the natural. But reveal your wisdom and your cosmic purposes in the here and now. Lord, you are a massive God that we trust completely with every word you speak. So even now, as we pray, would you establish it in Jesus' name? And they all said, Amen. We're going to sign off for those who uh, are on stream. We bless you. But we're going to take communion now. Sarah's going to play. Continue to play wonderfully.